Um, in that case, we will continue with our exploration of the different senses of our body. Um, and today we're going to talk about um, two senses, taste and smell. These two senses have something in common. Um, can you tell me what that is? Yes. Oh, was it not a, not a hand? <laughs> OK. <laughs> Anybody know? Yeah. If you have a sense of smell, you can taste things better. Yep, that's true, and we'll talk about why that is. Okay, another reason they're similar? Um, they're both like stimulated by chemicals. Yes, absolutely. They both sense chemicals. So we've talked about di several different types of senses this week already. We talked about the sense of touch, which is a physical stimulus, and temperature, which is also a physical stimulus. Um, we've talked about the sense of sight, which senses light. And now we're talking about taste and smell, which sense chemicals. So. Um, it's really useful that we have the ability to sense all kinds of different things in our environment. All right, so um, first we're going to cover smell, and then uh, we'll do some activities, and then we will reconvene and cover taste. So to start out, I want you uh, to think of some things that you smell in your environment, maybe some smells that you like. Just quickly turn to your partner and just share. What is, what is your favorite smell? Or maybe there's something you smelled this morning. Just, just share some smells that pop into your head. All right, it sounds like some of you could go on and on about smells. Um, so sh shout some out. Shout out some smells that you liked. Just shout out some smells. Because I know a lot of you had a lot. I heard a lot of good things. I heard coconut over here. Cinnamon. Rain. Books. What else? Books are great. <laughs> the beach. Yeah, that has a good smell. What was that? Lavender. Lavender is nice grass. All right, so we have lots of ideas about good smells. Some of them I agree with because I put some of my favorite smells up here. And uh, you might have noticed that the more you thought about it, the more smells you came up with because there are trillions of smells. <laughs> All right, the idea is that there are lots and lots of different smells that we can smell. And um, there are lots of, so uh, for example, the smell of um, a rose is more than just one chemical, right? So there are many different chemicals in a rose that make up its smell. And um, different types of chemicals can combine in different ways to give us smells of different items in our world. So once again, we have this, um, this problem of how does our body sense these chemicals in the environment? And then how does the brain process it to give us um, a certain type of smell. Um, but first, why, uh, so what do we need smell for in our life? Or not just us, but all animals. What do we need smell for? And because I forgot which order I did this <laughs> lecture in, I already gave away one of them. Find food. Find food. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> you were paying attention. Very good. All right, so we need to find food. And um, not just to find, so some animals hunt by smell, for example, so that's the finding food part. But also when we're eating food, we need to be able to identify what it is and if it's good to eat. All right, so food's one thing. What's another thing that we need smell for? Is that a hand? A reluctant hand? No? OK. In the back? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, so what are some things in your surroundings that could be dangerous that you might want to identify by smell? Yeah. Gas, okay. Poisons, I guess. Poisons in the air, maybe. Yeah, what else? Zombies. Fire, absolutely. If there's like a fire in the forest, you probably want to stay away from that. Um, anything else? What about if you are not a bear, but a rabbit? 
Predators, yeah. If you're the rabbit, you probably want to know where the bear is so you can stay away from it. That's good. Um, anything else? Yes? A skunk? Okay. Uh, why would you want to stay away from a skunk? <laughs> All right, so I think this, this probably... Prey. It's prey, yeah. But it wants, to, it wants to deter predators, right? So it's kind of... Maybe this is um, the skunk taking advantage of, uh, of other animals' sense of smell um, to keep them away from itself. Yeah, that's a good one. I didn't put that up here, but that's a very good thought. Um, and they actually use it also to uh, mark territory. So saying like, mm -hmm. it's mine. So I live here, try to avoid this territory. Because the bear is going to take away my territory. Yeah. So marking your territory falls into another category that I'm going to put up here. So when you're, what, what is that signal? That signal is to, like another animal maybe of your own species, right? So one smell is one way to communicate with other animals, so it's a good social cue. Um, how, do any of you have dogs? Yeah, when you take your dog on a walk and it meets another dog. Starts barking. It barks? Barking, and then, yeah, then they smell. Then they smell each other, right? Yeah. yeah, so they can find out a lot of social information about each other by smelling. Good, and then what's another thing, a uh, more specific part? It's also sort of a social interaction, maybe, um, but something that animals need to do. What's another, what's a really big reason why animals would want to interact with other members of their own species? Mate, Mate exactly. <laughs> Good, all right. So um, mating, finding mates, social information, and detecting danger. Um, yeah, so lots of animals find mates by smell. Um, especially insects do this. They can follow the scent of another insect um, for a long distance um, to, in order to find their mates. Um, good. All right. Okay, so now, now we <laughs> get to uh, this question of how do we actually sense smells um, and how does this information get to the brain? So basically, uh, everybody knows what the organ is where we sense smell, right? Just shout it out. Nose, very good. Um, an easy question. All right, but there are different parts of the nose. So the, uh, the air flows into your nose, and then you have this big nasal cavity, and in it there is a uh, membrane, like skin basically, that's moist. And in this moist membrane, it's called the olfactory epithelium, um, there are nerve endings. So... Um, Oh, yes, sorry, <laughs> I, I assumed. So olfaction is a fancy word for the sense of smell. Um, all right, and so I hope that at this point, having covered some of the sensory systems already, you're starting to see a pattern. Usually there's some kind of specialized organ for the specialized sense, and within that organ, there are usually some kind of neuron that senses um, the, the stimulus for that um, sensory system. And... Um, all right, so we have specialized uh, cells, often neurons, that sense the stimulus. And within these cells, there are special molecules um, that are they're proteins, and they're present inside these cells. And uh, those proteins sense the, the chemicals in the environment um, in the sense of smell. So um, I'm saying this is a pattern that you should have seen so far because we already discussed proteins that sense temperature and proteins that sense light. And now we have proteins that sense the chemicals in the air. And kind of a cool thing about the olfactory system is that we have many, many of these proteins that sense different types of chemicals. And since there are trillions of types of smells, we, need, we don't have trillions of these receptors, but we need many of them in order to be able to smell many different types of things. And a really interesting thing is that each of these um, specialized neurons um, have only one type of odor receptor. Okay, so we have many of, many of these receptor cells, and each one only has one type of photoreceptor, but there are many of them. Okay, does that make sense? All right. And uh, 
So you can imagine that if an animal has many genes for different types of odor receptors, it might be better at smelling than another kind of animal. So we have a graph here that shows how many genes for odor receptors an animal has, and there are different types of animals on the graph. So could somebody, someone guess um, where humans are on this graph? Three eighty. That's a very good guess. <laughs> All right, but you're. Um, I think you would actually be correct. Um, <laughs> I don't know how you know that, but that's oh, very good. Well, I guess because dogs, they like they apparently they smell twice as much as a human. Mm -hmm. So a human has to be less than a dog. And yeah. Dogs almost have the same type of smell as a bear. So I just put it in the three eighty range. That's good. Yeah, there are a bunch of animals here, right, that are sort of in the same range. Um, and certainly we, we would guess that humans are sort of at the lower end among all these animals. Good. Okay, so dogs are very good at smelling, so you'd put them higher up. Where would you put them um, roughly? 1,230. This one? Yeah. Okay, that's a good guess. I don't know if that's right, but we'll see in a minute. <laughs> um, <laughs> what do you think this one is, the one at the very top? Any guess? Some animal that's good at smelling, needs lots of odor receptors. Just throw out some guesses. Snake. Snake. Interesting guess. All right. Raccoon. All right. Well, this might be a surprise to you then. It's actually an elephant at the very top. Um, let's just check our other guesses. So humans, oh, you were almost right. Almost, that's pretty good. And then dogs are actually a bit lower down than we expected. Um, but there are actually two parts of how well you can smell. One is how many different types can you smell, and one is how well, or what's the smallest amount of something that you can smell. And dogs might not have so many, uh, as many receptors as we expected, given how good it is at smelling, but it might, um, uh, it's, it's better able to detect very small amounts of the smells that it is able to smell. Um, all right, so at the very top we have elephants. Does anyone have any idea why elephants might have so many receptors? Are they like really well known for smelling? Their trunks. Their trunks. They have long trunks, this is true, but I don't know if their entire trunk is used for smelling. I'm guessing maybe not. So, or, all right, so elephants are not super famous for smelling, but something that's interesting about elephants is that they are very social animals. So they really care about the other members of their herd, they interact with them a lot, they have close family ties and so on. They also travel over very long distances and they communicate over long distances. So my guess would be that elephants need this sophisticated sense of smell for social reasons. Okay. So now we're going to quickly do a thought experiment, and you can follow along on the second page of the handout. And um, if I if I draw on that side, will you be able to see it? Yes. Okay. So the thought experiment is: um, you want to know what you you've identified some gene, and you want to know what kind of smell it it senses, okay? So one, um, one animal that you can easily use for experiments is flies. And in flies, you can make knockouts really easily. So um, we can make a fly uh, that does not have this gene that we identified. And we're gonna use that to figure out what smell the gene is responsible for. So I want you guys to design the experiment and um, you can see already on the sheet that we're going to need four different conditions. So you're going to tell me what we're going to do. Sorry, we'll actually move forward. And that's a hint. Yeah? I can try, yes. OK. Um, all right, so uh, this is a hint for how the experiment is going to work. So you will tell me how we're going to set up the experiment and what the results are that we expect to find. So who wants to start us off? I'm going to give you a hint. We're going to have this 
circular plate. And the idea is sort of similar to the um, temperature test that we talked about at the very beginning with mice. All right, so who wants to give it a shot? How can we test if a fly can smell something? Mm -hmm. Good. Yep, that's, that's exactly it. So let's start out with, um, let's just pick a scent. Let's call it scent A. And we'll start out with that. So we have scent A on this side and nothing on this side. And then what? We place a fly. Yeah. Okay. Place a fly in the middle. We might want to place a bunch of flies. Let's, let's place like a bunch of flies in the middle. And then what will happen? If this is a normal fly, what will happen? It will go to the side? With the smell. With the smell. Okay, let's assume it likes the smell. Sometimes flies don't like a certain kind of smell, but let's assume that they, can, they like it, and they will move over here. So you give them some time to roam around, and after a while, you will be able to see if they prefer one side or the other. So now, what if we take um, the mutant fly that we made, the knockout fly, that doesn't have this gene that we think is responsible for sensing odor A. So let's set up another plate. Put odor A over here. And now we're going to put some mutant flies on there. Yeah. Can we draw this on this? You can draw. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can draw them if you want to. It's, we're not going to collect them or anything. But if you want to follow along, feel free to do that. All right, so in the second condition, we, we placed a bunch of mutant flies in the middle of the plate. So what happens in this case? Yeah, OK. Yeah, I think they probably won't just stay in the same place because flies like moving around. But they won't care either way, so they'll just go randomly on both sides. right? And that will tell us that they cannot sense the smell. Um, but now um, we need to do something else also to make sure that this experiment is valid. We need some control conditions. So can someone describe to me what kind of control you will need? Yeah. Yeah, petri dish without food. So why do we need that, and what will happen? This is our control. And we're going to do it for both types, right? So now we have no food on either side. We put our flies in the middle. And what will happen now? Yeah, they shouldn't care, and they will go e either place. And the knockouts? Either way. Yep. OK. Why do we need to do this? This seems boring. We just get random dispersal of the flies. Why do we need to do that? Yeah. Or doesn't matter. Um, you make sure there's nothing else in the environment that's affecting it. Yes, exactly. So you need to make sure that these flies aren't moving over here because they like this side better for some other reason. Maybe this side is warmer and they like that. So we need to make sure that. The reason they're over here is because of this particular odor A, right? Good. All right. So you got it. Um, so maybe that seemed really easy to you because you guys are very smart. But people do this kind of fly experiment. People, scientists do this all the time, exactly this kind of experiment. <laughs> OK. All right. Great. You guys got it. Um, so next. Uh, all right. One more part. OK, so um, just so um, right, so we have all these uh, different odor neurons in the epithelium in the nose. And I already hinted that the processing of a smell, it can be a little bit complicated in the brain because you have to combine different types of chemicals into one type of smell. So the brain needs to figure that out somehow. And we're not going to go into all the details. We're just going I'm just going to mention that the first place, that um, this information goes in the brain is called 
uh, an olfactory bulb. And something interesting about the olfactory bulb is that in there, it collects all the information from the same odor receptor together in one bundle. So remember, each, um, each olfactory neuron has only one kind of receptor, and all the neurons that have the same receptor get collected together. So I think that's, that's pretty cool. And um, let's quickly look at the olfactory bulbs from different types of animals. So the first one, um, can you identify what this is? Uh, what animal this brain is from? You're looking at it from the bottom, if that's a hint. I will in a second. Human, yes, this is the human brain. And the olfactory bulb is actually highlighted in yellow. So there are these tiny little things that stick out here near the front of the brain. So um, that's us. Next, we have this brain. Can you guess what this brain is? Bird? Bird? Well, that's a good guess. I mean, maybe. <laughs> um, I'll give you a hint. or. I'll lead you towards a hint. Where do you think the olfactory bulbs are on this brain? Does someone want to like run up and try to point at it? I'll give you another hint. They're much bigger. <laughs> what do you think? Um, uh, yeah, we'll have a hint yeah. To that, top part. that top part. Yeah, there. This. This is the olfactory bulbs in this brain. So compare that to the human ones, much bigger. So that might make you guess that this animal is much better at smelling than humans. So now what do you think this animal might be? A dog. A dog. Could be a dog. It is a dog. All right, let's look at another one. Um, on this one, where do you think the olfactory bulbs are? You see them? <laughs> They're similar to the dog, they're at the top here, but they're these um, round things, they look sort of more flat than the rest of the brain. So a bit smaller in this animal. Any guesses what it might be? A rat? A rat? It's not a rat, it's a bit bigger. So this is, this is a sheep. Sheep are not famous for being able to smell very well, so their olfactory bulbs are smaller. All right, last one. Um, this one is from the top now, not, not from the bottom. So this guy, where are the olfactory bulbs? At the top? Yeah. And they're these. They're like really sticking out. They're really big compared to the rest of this small brain. Any guesses what this animal could be? A rat. A rat? Yeah. It's a mouse, but that's really close. Yeah. So this is really impressive that they have these giant <laughs> olfactory bulbs compared to the rest of their brain size. Whereas humans have this giant brain and they have these just these really tiny olfactory bulbs. Yeah. So um, do you think that uh, humans, like how do you feel about human sense of smell? Are we good at it? Are we not so good at it? I think I sort of already gave you the answer to that. Not, not that good at it. There are many reasons why maybe we're not that good at it. One is we don't have so many odor receptor genes. One is we don't have such a big olfactory bulb, right? What are some reasons why humans might not be so good at the smelling? Yeah. We don't need it as much as other animals? Yeah, yeah. We might not need it as, a, a, need it as much as other animals. So if you think about the four reasons that we said other animals need the sense of smell, some of them might not be so important to us anymore. For example, we don't hunt by smell. That's not really something we need. Um, we might not need as many um, olfactory cues when we're interacting with other humans, right? We actually we don't smell each other, right? usually not. I mean, we we actually really try to sense our, our own uh, hide our own smell. Like we take a lot of showers and wear deodorant and so on to kind of hide our human smell. Um, so yeah, so we've kind of um, evolved to not need the sense of smell as much. Um, but we can still smell a lot of things. Um, we just don't pay as much attention to it either. So we're going to do now a little activity um, where you get to smell different things, and you have to try and identify what they are. And these smells are um, hidden. They're in these little um, 
uh, vials. So what, when you're smelling them, try not to look inside. Um, and then on the last page of your worksheet, you can write down what you think the smell is. 